This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean and by Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device or your first month of service. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 321. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Good morning to you, Matt. Are you ready for me to tell folks about the big show today? Definitely. All right, well, coming up in the second half of this show, we'll talk with the core developer of Kali Linux about why that distribution is such a great penetration testing distribution, if he's worried about maybe mm. some unwanted light being shed on their distribution, and the future direction, as well as a lot ah. of other things. We got into a bunch of great stuff in our chat That's right. in the news segment. We're going to take a look at the new Plasma 5 desktop and the KDE 5 frameworks and all of that good stuff and explain what the heck all of these different things are that are coming out. Sorry, if you've man. been confused by a lot of the KDE name changes, we'll cover some of that. Plus, nice. we've got our regular news we're going to talk about. In the feedback segment, we've got an awesome video clip I'm going to tell you about here and more in a little bit. But first, Matt. Yes. It's our picks. Woo I know, right? And uh, I, I think this first one, I, I think it was last week, yeah. I put a call out for uh, folks to send in their runs Linux. We got a couple of great ones. So if you sent in a runs Linux and you don't see it featured today or next week, don't worry. I've made a queue and I want more of your runs Linux, but I really wanted to focus on the ones that did video first. Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's kind of like the go-to so thing. Our first one, our first runs Linux submitted by the audience comes from Kernel Linux, a.k.a. Noah. You guys know him oh, from yeah. our Fest coverage. He sent in a radio station that his company helped set up that runs Linux. Now, here's what we're going to do, because this is kind of a long piece. Uh, we're going to play the first little bit to tease you guys what this is, and then we'll play the rest of the video, because he tours the entire radio station, oh, yes, nice shows you where all the Linux is. Oh, yeah, isn't this great it's video? A gra I was just yeah. blown away. So it, it's definitely worth watching if you're just like interested in how Linux could power an entire radio station. So I'll show you the teaser part so you get an idea, and then we'll play the rest in the feedback. Noah, take it away. Hi, it's Noah, or Kernel Linux in the chat room. Some of you may recognize me from some of the interviews I've done for Jupiter Broadcasting, and this is my Runs Linux. My dad has devoted his life to making healthy food that actually tastes good. The project started when a local nonprofit group contacted him asking him to be part of a local FM radio station they wanted to launch. After coming on board with them, they began to plan out the technical details of putting the radio station on the air. My dad suggested to the group that Altaspeed, my company, might be able to help. After we got involved, we sat down and got a general idea of what they wanted to accomplish. The goal was to put a radio station on the air, be able to take remote broadcasts, have multiple people control or edit the station's content. All of this had to be reliable and, of course, had to stay within the budget. All right, so we'll play the rest because he gives in. He goes into full detail about how where they use Linux at mm -hmm. each part, from like literally to the feed that goes on the intent to the, to the, to the broadcast antenna to people's desk. It's really cool. It's it's amazing. It's amazing how deep it really goes. And how how awesome was it of mm -hmm. Noah to send that in too? That was great. Like uh, super cool. So, anyways, uh, go, we'll uh, we'll play the rest of that uh, later on in the show in the feedback segment because it's so awesome. But it's oh, like yeah. it's like eight minutes long. So. I thought it was a little bit too long to play. They're all, but definitely a sit down and watch. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about DigitalOcean, our Yeesh. sponsor for this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. You guys know about DigitalOcean, mm -hmm. don't you? Go over to DigitalOcean.com and keep the promo code last July handy because that's going to get you a $10 credit. But let me tell you a little bit about DigitalOcean and why you'd want to switch. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a cloud server in under 55 seconds, and pricing plans start only $5 per nice. month. It gets you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one blazing fast CPU, and a terabyte of transfer connected to tier one bandwidth. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. Their interface is super simple. Their control panel is the definition of intuitive, and power users can replicate that on a much larger scale with their beautiful straightforward API. You can scale it to your infrastructure needs. If you need to spin up servers, DigitalOcean is also great if you have an internal infrastructure, but you want to be able to scale on demand and you want to know exactly how much that scaling is going to cost you. Why not use their straightforward API to spin up DigitalOcean droplets on demand as you need them and you can shunt web traffic or database traffic over to there. And because they have these tier one connections and they're sitting on top of these SSD drives, you know you're not going to have any problem. And you know, here at Jupyter Broadcasting, we were recently trying to... Uh, sort of spitball a few things we want to work on, maybe improve. Yeah. And uh, it came into, okay, well, we need to test these ideas. 
And it was such an obvious conclusion. Well, let's go over to DigitalOcean and make a droplet. I know it's going to cost us $5 for you to have root access to a cloud server that we can run these tests from. We can run it for a few months if we need to. We can run it indefinitely. And the great thing about it was is I already had a droplet template I could pull from. Nice. So totally ready to roll. Just yep. grab that droplet, redeployed it, and Rekai was up and running in literally under a minute. Well, and how easy it is to SSH into this or to run a WordPress site or to, uh, in my case, I run WordPress and a BitTorrent sync. Um, you right. Know what I mean, I, pfft, you know, you, you just got to do it. And that, that, that control panel, <laughs> I mean, this is like the yeah. gold standard that everybody now has to compete with. And DigitalOcean continues to iterate and make it better and better and better and continues to build on their one click installs. You want GitLab, you want WordPress. Just one-click install. It's so awesome. And if you use the promo code last July when you check out, well, you're going to get a $10 credit. You can try out that $5 rig for two months. $5 rig for two months for free. They also have hourly pricing if you just need to do some testing. Go see why SSD really does make a difference in your server. That I.O. throughput absolutely makes a difference. Plus, that simple control panel, the amazing hardware, the KVM virtualization that powers it all. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code last July when you check out. And a really big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. And by the way, guys, uh, they're hiring, too. Nice. Yeah, and they've asked me to let you know because they need really talented people and guess what? That's probably the Linux Action Show audience. That's you guys. Uh, I got a couple of really cool picks this week that I want to go through. The first one is a, a new video player. Now, I know we all oh love my VLC. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> I know, I know. MPV. Okay. It's a fork of M Player Two, which really has not seen any active development no, for really a hasn't. while now. Mm. MPV launched at the beginning of 2014. Today, they just released a new version, so we're talking about it, okay. and it is a really great media player. Now, it's maybe a little more um, advanced. I only use it via the command line, uh -huh. uh, but one of the things that I like about it, it's got really, really good codec detection and really fantastic OpenGL support, Ooh, so the video okay. playback will be video accelerated. So That'd I wanted nice. to show you, for as an example, okay. you could play, obviously, almost anything in a program like MPV. It's similar to VLC. I like the fact that right here I can type in MPV and then okay. I've pasted in the RTSP stream of the JB live stream. And now I am able to play back the JB live stream through MPV. It will go through, it'll auto detect all of the codecs that are oh, muxed in wow. there. It will do OpenGL acceleration if it's possible. So there it is right there. And here I'm going to pull oh. up. Uh, so I like the OpenGL aspect and I love the fact that you can actually see what it's doing behind the scenes. And, have a and nice you see visual, here right? it says audio video desynchronization detected. MPV now goes through and makes the corrections to try to sync up the audio and oh, the video. Sweet. Now that'll happen on an RTSP stream and right. eventually it levels sure. out. But you can see how cool it is to see, okay, yes, I have OpenGL support. I can use compositing. Mm -hmm. Compositing window manager detected, assuming timing info is inaccurate. I like see. it's very smart. Very verbose. Ver ver uh, ver gives you me know the what's going on. codec info. Mm -hmm. It's a 960 by 540 stream. Uh, and this would work for any media file type That's you great. want. I particularly like it to grab live streams. I think it's really handy because you can throw an RTMP yeah. or RTSP stream at it or an HLS. I would assume I haven't tried it. And it'll just pull it down and play it for you. MPV is pretty much going to play any file that you throw at it. Well, the way I've worked with it is I'll just do MPV on the command line space, file name, opens it right up. I like seeing the output in the terminal, too. I think that's kind of neat. It's very cool, because especially if you're trying to troubleshoot a stream that you're like, okay, something's not quite right. I don't really know what it yeah. is. I want to I want to be able to understand what's going on. And hey, maybe even have it corrected for me. Well, and hey, isn't it nice to do like yeah. a sanity check? Like, why isn't exactly. this playing right in VLC? Let me do a sanity check in MPV. And it's giving you information in plain English, which yeah. is cool. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, you can check that out. Uh, MPV.io, I think, mm -hmm. is the URL. We'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, I featured it because it's... It's amazing. It's only, like I mentioned, it's only been out since like January. It's amazing how far they've come, especially yeah. for a fork. And it's already like one of, I would say like the number, it's like the number two or number three video player under Linux. It's Whoa. really, it's blowing up big time. And it's because it's very capable. They're also iterating very fast, which yeah. is nice. Uh, they're adding features and fixing bugs, which is nice too. So well, and I, I was never a big in player guy. I just, it just really yeah. wasn't for me. I like, I like what they're doing with this instead. I just feel like it, for one thing, their site's really yeah. attractive. It yeah. looks nice. Merck X in our uh, live chat room uh, says he just fired it up right now. It looks good. And uh, yeah, it's mpv.io for, mm -hmm. uh, for the for uh, the player. And don't forget, by the way, you can join us live on Sundays, 10 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. You can hang out in our chat room. You get to chat with us in between segment breaks and join us for pre-show. And Matt, it is. just before you got here, I played the most epic Star You can go look it up on YouTube. Star Trek versus BSG. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Have you seen I've it? Seen that. It's it like a thirty-minute battle. Believable yeah. because it's like they. It's not, and it wasn't slapped together like no. it's just raw edits. They really thought out their strategy. It's amazing. It and, was uh, awesome. We played it on the pre-show today, and, and you know, you show you know you're rooting for Star Trek. I know. Oh, you come, know. On. Uh, I'm come on, for, I'm rooting for BSG. I got to tell you, dude. I'm sorry, dude. Dude, yeah. does BSG have holodex? Doesn't matter. Oh, they do have Starbucks. Now, yeah. I like that. Well, anyways, uh, yeah, Andreas, MPV, okay. yeah, mpv.io <laughs> if you want to get grab that. It's 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 getting pretty popular. Yeah. Something else we're keeping our eye on these days is the Unreal Engine 4. Big news oh when they God. announced support for Linux. And we thought, okay, well, we'll sit back. At least I thought this. Yeah. We'll wait at least a year, and we won't hear anything. Anything. Like, it's going to take them at least a year to get some code written that runs mm -hmm. on Linux. Nope. Totally no. wrong. There it is. Way wrong. GamingOnLinux.com wrote up an article featuring the uh, Unreal demos. I saw these last week. Didn't make it into the show, so I'm so glad they wrote them up because it reminded me. These are downloadable files available right now that use the Unreal Engine 4 to render an entire environment. It's a demo mode, plus you can go in a walk around. They're super amazing. The plus, they're... They can really push your system, so which is good. Why Unless don't we you know what's going on? Why don't we give it a go on the bonobo? What do you say, man? Uh, so I'm with the one I'm going to the one I'm opting to show you guys. There's lots, in including one called Sci-Fi, which is super cool and fantasy, mm -hmm. and uh, Tappy Bird, which is like Flappy Bird. But the one we're looking at right now is called Blueprints, and it's called Blueprints because this is this is for developers to get an idea of some of the functionality the Unreal Engine can provide them. So here is a really cool building that we can walk around in. You get a, you get a sense of the ambiance and the environment that it provides. Very amazing lighting effects. We can look out and you can see the city out in the distance there. I mean, it looks good. And as you really walk good. up, like I mentioned, this is for developers. So as you walk up, it's, it tells you about these blueprints. These blueprints are functionality that the Unreal Engine just makes available to game developers where they don't have to do any coding or they just have to do the connection coding. So here's an example. They say, these butterflies demonstrate how blueprints can be used to create and animate actors with simple AI behavior. So there's example. So there's some example butterflies. If we walk up over here, cut, and look how gorgeous I mean, this is. It's just unbelievable. Look how gorgeous it really this is. is. So uh, here's one. These blueprints are designed to make adding atmospheric meshes to a level easier. For example, the light beam blue blueprints can automatically orient themselves to match a specific light actor and customize in a variety of ways. So you just say, hey, I want light rays. Here's where my light source is. Figure out the rest. And you see it does the sheen yeah, and there. Yeah, you can actually see the differentiating of yeah. the light rays as Cast you walk into it. Cast the shadow it. there. It, it's, like, it's like you're actually walking into the room and experiencing those light rays. It's very convincing. This mesh here talks about uh, this, how, how you can say, I need some foliage here. Just automatically make it shape to the mesh. Uh, and I take a note here. Oh, a couple more things I want to show you, and then we'll move on here. See this camera here? See how it just turned red there? And oh, now yeah. it'll, it'll track me. And again, the developer doesn't have to do any coding there, but what's even more awesome and really shows you how advanced this engine is, is if we go back over here to this side of the room, you'll see that these things are actually all interconnected. So oh, here's can, an the example. The cameras are interconnected, okay. Yeah, and you can connect them. You can have these cameras drive mm. other events in the map. So you see how that door is open right now? Right. If this camera sees me, it's green. It's it like, closes oh, red, the door. red alert, and the camera reacts. Right. The alarm comes on. Door so shut. now let's trick it. We'll go Done. away. See, now the camera's looking for me because there's a little bit of AI there. Now I'm going to sneak past the camera. I'll sneak in the room here. Oh, and if nice. I go over and hit this button... This is now a feed of all those security cameras we just saw. Dude, that is awesome. You and don't have to write any of this. Unreal Engine is writing all of this. You integrate it in. I love it. And you could see how this could make for a very cool gameplay oh, element. Oh, yeah. All just handed to you. Well, and it means that you're going to have more games, more rapidly developed, well-developed, consistent. Um, a lot of the niceties right. are already integrated in. Yeah. Cool. And uh, and for those of you that see the video tearing, that is just a capture thing. There's no actual local video yeah. tearing. That's um, we're sending a 30 hertz signal to uh, our HDMI capture card, and that 30 hertz signal can't keep up with the right. movement. So there's sometimes some tearing. So if you're looking at this local, it's going to look good. There's no tearing. Yeah. There's no yeah. weirdness. It looks fantastic. Yeah, so. and you can see they give you little descriptions as you go around. They have a whole bunch of ones, you guys. Yep. So there's a whole bunch of great ones to go download, check out like the sci-fi and the fantasy ones. You just download them, extract them, and then go into the directory and run the file in the engine folder. And uh, Bob's your uncle. And be amazed. You know, I think when you have a when you're calling your your product Unreal, you have a certain expectation you have to live up to. <laughs> it, and I think that's what they're trying to do. It is, but it's looking more and more real. I tell you oh, what. Yeah. No, I mean like it's got to be awesome. Yeah, they had a uh, they so. had uh, a couple of demos in there with some people in it that. Uh, I, I, I just looking at it and just stunned with how amazing the people looked. It was really incredible. It's really exciting times. And it, I, all, the other thing I'm noticing, too, is it's definitely pushing uh, the uh, video graphics drivers. You know, it's exposing some areas where maybe there needs to be some optimizations, sure. optimizations either in the Unreal Engine or in the drivers. Mm -hmm. 
I have a very, very powerful system upstairs uh, that is not as powerful, uh, that is much more powerful than the Bonobo, even sure, several generations newer than the Bonobo. Mm -hmm. Still plays better for some reason on the Bonobo. Really? And it's NVIDIA wow. graphics, and and I'm not sure what that is. So to me, it suggests perhaps some driver issues, but I'm not yeah. sure. It could be maybe something I have configured wrong on my yeah, machine. It's hard to say. You know, get something designed for Linux, and it just goes. Hey, Matt, before we jump into the news segment, I wanted mm -hmm. to mention an initiative that uh, we're launching that's essentially, uh, I'm calling it, uh, prevent Chris from burning out initiative, at least the short term. Uh, Patreon.com slash today. We're trying to raise some funds for the Jupiter Broadcasting Network and establish a money platform, essentially, where we know on a reoccurring basis so we can budget exactly how much money is coming in because what I want to do is hire a couple of contractors for some short-term work initially and we also have some hardware improvements to make us better at mobile setups to give us some backups when we have hardware failures right now behind the scenes we are struggling with a series of hardware failures that have left us sort of gimped it's affected Linux okay. Unplugged the most we've been able to isolate yeah. it from the rest of the shows but it's examples of where we have reached our limits in terms of what we can self-fund without having to add a lot more advertising mm -hmm. And it seems like the better route to go is to reach out to the crowd, keep you guys the boss. Patreon.com slash today is where you go. This is integrated with the Tech Talk Today show because we celebrate our milestones in the Tech Talk Today show and essentially keeps Tech Talk, Tech Talk Today on the air Monday through Thursday. So it's a supplement to that. But what this really is is all the revenue generated at Patreon.com slash today funds the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. Specifically, it's going to fund some initiatives we have here locally with contractors and hardware up first. Then it's, going to then it's going to fund a future project expansions and things like that. But it's all the types of situations where you have to know how much money is coming in right. on a monthly basis. That's what we want to establish. Plus, the other great thing about Patreon is it's very transparent. You guys can see where we're at. You can see the dollar amount we're bringing in, the various milestones of what we want to accomplish when we reach there. We have preset pledge levels. If you can give $3 a month, this helps support all of the shows by giving $3 a month. There's also some, you can give any amount I mean, you like want, cup, more or it's less. It's like a cup of Starbucks coffee or something, right? I mean, it's like... It's less than a hamburger. Yeah, it's like, come on. And uh, and uh, if you want, we have suggestion pledge levels, including a limited availability of swag that we'll be sending out for uh, the bottom pledge level, the highest level there is from time to time. We're going to send out swag. We've already done one round, it's, uh, and we're, we're already getting the next round ready. Mm -hmm. And you can get in with that if you become the swag level, and there's a limited amount available. So go over to patreon.com slash today. Uh, if you can't help, no big deal. Uh, we still love to have you participate in the subreddits, sure. email the shows, join the live streams. All of that is also awesome contributions. Or even just listening and patronizing the sponsors that we do have and Absolutely. the sponsors that we love and pick. And we want to be able to stay very picky about those sponsors. So by you continuing to patronize them it allow, and by this Patreon page, by adding another platform of funding, we hope to continue to reach a good balance between content and sponsorship. Right. That's really the goal here. And to diversify Jupiter Broadcasting's funding so that way if one particular source of revenue drew dries up, you know, went away, uh, then the network wouldn't go away. Because exactly. really what happens with a lot of internet businesses is they find a, a revenue model after mm -hmm. a few years and they, they sort of build all dependency on that revenue stream. And then when that revenue stream goes away, the internet business goes away. I don't want that. To, Jupiter Broadcasting is like, it's got at least another 30 years in it and I need your help. So go over to patreon.com slash today to become a supporter of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network at all. You can All of the shows get, uh, this will help those shows specifically because we're investing in hardware and labor with this funding. And we really appreciate it. Patreon.com slash. Really quickly, I wanted to address the confusion that I see pop up almost every day. So the, the show that's included in this Patreon, to, to explain this simply, it's basically, it's a give back to the community. That's the, that's really kind of its purpose is that it's saying, hey, you know, thanks for thanks for stopping by and checking us out. Here's something I'm giving back is kind of a, is kind of a nicety. It's not going directly only to the show. It's going to the whole network. Yeah. Itself. So, you know, it, I, I see that come up a lot. It's like, I don't understand how that, I just want to make sure I'm cl we're clear on that. You got it. You nailed it, Matt. Yeah. That's like, a, it's, you know. it's my way because I, right. I don't, I'm not the type of person who's like, hey, just give me money exactly. and then not give you something right. in return. So Tech Talk Today is my thank you. Right. Chris is offering value in exchange for your and contribution. Plus, it keeps, if you if you enjoy a, even maybe one or two of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network shows, I think there's value in that Definitely. Too. And we just really appreciate it. You know, uh, we, we come at it from a standpoint that's not quite as conventional. It's not quite as commercial. We try to keep it indie. We try to keep it real here. And that's what we're trying to do there. And I'll mm -hmm. also, from time to time, be posting exclusives for folks that are at any Patreon level right. at that page, just like videos and stuff like that from behind the scenes. In fact, if you become a patron now, you get access to all of the previous behind the scenes videos I've posted there. Ooh. So there you go. Ooh, awesome. All right, Matt. Bonus content. Let's do the news. Hey, 
it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com, Matt. Go to last.ting.com to get started because Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting is my mobile service provider and Matt's mobile service provider. Matt, how's your Note 2 doing? You know, I'm liking it. I'm liking it. And there is... I I was all excited because there was going to be this Chromecast update. It's still yet to come to the phone, but when it does, I'm pretty excited because you can be able to broadcast your screen. The whole screen. I'm very excited about that. That's awesome. Also, my new favorite thing is Multi-ROM. If you haven't checked out Multi-ROM yet and you have a Nexus 5, totes, go get Multi-ROM. I think I'm going to put Android L on here next week and then dual boot between the latest stable Android. And the great thing about Ting is they're like, yeah, just don't mess anything up. Cool. And they have a community around that too over at help.ting.com. But let's talk about uh, Ting a little bit because I think something you need to know about Ting, get this, no contract. No contracts. No early termination fee. And you only pay for what you use, a flat $6 per month for Ting. There it is. I, I can't emphasize this enough, because instead of just locking you into what you might need to pay, so that way you pay into some big plan every single month, you just pay for what you use. They just mm-hmm. take your minutes, your message, your megabytes, they add them up at the end of the month, whatever bucket you fall into, shoot, that's what you pay. They also have hotspot and tethering, picture messaging, caller ID, all the stuff you'd expect, and an amazing dashboard to manage your phone. Yes. And when you get a brand new Ting phone, they'll automatically set some alert thresholds for you that integrate with the app that's also on your Android or iOS device. And that way you can just be like, oh, geez, I've used a gig. Thanks for letting me know, Ting, or whatever they set it to. It's really nice that they do that. The other thing, if you're making the switch to Ting, you know they've got your back because you can call them anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. or Eastern. Where the, that's where the Canadians live yes. on the East Coast. At 1-855-TING-FTW. 1-855-TING-FTW. And a real person actually answers the phone. Now get ready for this part. Got- that person actually knows how to solve your problem and is empowered to solve your problem. They don't have to transfer you to somebody else. They don't have to send you up to the next tech support tier. They're just Android geeks ready to answer your question or Windows phone geeks or iOS geeks, whoever you're calling in to talk to. Check out Ting. Check out their dashboard. And one of the things I love about Ting is they are Android fans. And I love their Android app picks. And they've got one this week that I think might be particularly useful for guys like me. Mm Want to spice up your Instagram photos and create cool collages? I'm Kyra and this is Ting's App of the Week. PhotoGrid lets you create great photos in seconds. With a simple interface and drag and drop tools, you'll be astonished at how easily you can make top notch pictures for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. After opening the app, choose what type of photo you want to build. Grid lets you arrange multiple photos inside one picture. Swap your photos to place them where you want and use their photo editing tools to create your one of a kind collage. To switch up the grid style, choose layout. Or simply shake the device. Ah, nice. that's cool. That's and don't cool. you find it irritating that Instagram cuts off the edges of your photo? Yes. Photo Grid's single option has a fit Instagram mode, which resizes your photos so the entire image can be shared on Instagram. To view Photo Grid's editing options, tap on the photo. You can choose from tons of filters, rotate the image, crop, <laughs> zoom, and much more. When you're ready to upload your masterpiece, choose share. <laughs> and pick your desired channel. That's so cool. You can also save the picture to your device in a variety of resolutions and image formats. PhotoGrid has everything you need to create classy snaps on your smartphone. Free for Android and iPhone, you can find direct links in the description below. Thanks for watching Ting's App of the Week. If you're interested in more app reviews, make sure to subscribe to our channel. That is really cool. I'm going to have to pass that along to Ange. Yeah. I think she would like that one. So go to last.ting.com to get started. That'll take $25 off your first Ting device. If you have a Ting-compatible device, they're going to give you $25 of Ting credit. That more than paid for my first month. That's Definitely. how economical Ting is, last.ting.com. And a really big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Woo. Linux Action Show. You guys rock. Uh, okay, Matt, I want to talk about some big news from the KDE mm. camp. KDE Frameworks. has been officially released. The KDE community is proud to announce KDE Frameworks 5.0. Frameworks 5 is the next generation of KDE libraries modularized and optimized for easy integration in Qt applications. All right, I want to stop right here. We're going to take a look at KDE 5 and Frameworks 5 here in a second. But we've gotten a lot of confusion out there. I, I, this is totally my problem too. We had it cleared up for me on Linux Unplugged on Tuesday. Uh, But a lot of people seem to be confused about what's going on with KDE, uh, what the release schedule is, what is being released, and uh, things like that. So I want to try to do my best to help people understand a little bit. Uh, And I'm I'm pulling from uh, various different sources that I have linked in the show notes. Uh, So uh, Marty Marty wrote on his blog, in response to uh, some of the confusion, he says, 
We used to have six-month big release cycles of all things KDE called just KDE in the beginning. Then we had KDE SC. I remember that. But this release is not that anymore because KDE has grown a lot in the past years. It's not just that anymore. It's a single release of everything, and that only scales so much. So they had to change things up. Um, the development cycle of all of the KDE stuff is going to be a lot faster now. You can expect a new release of the KDE frameworks. That's the libraries, not mm -hmm. the applications. Gotcha. Almost every month. Oh, wow. While Plasma 5, that's the desktop. The desktop is referred to as Plasma 5, will be every three months now. I could see how people could get confused. There's yeah, so you have you have a couple of things at play here. You have the frameworks, you have Plasma mm -hmm. Five. Uh, so I want to I want to kind of break it down, break it break, break it down for you, okay? So what is KDE? KDE is the all encompassing community. Think of it as yeah. like Mozilla to Firefox. Mozilla is the organization that Firefox is underneath. Windows is the product underneath Microsoft. Okay, Plasma ah. 5, the desktop, is the product underneath the KDE group. KDE is the community. KDE Plasma Workspaces, that's the workspaces created by KDE. This is what you log into. KDE okay. Plasma Workspaces is what you log into. That's the Windows, the desktop, the panels, all of that. There's different Plasma environments, like Plasma Desktop, that's the mm -hmm. most common. Plasma Notebook, Plasma Contour, etc., etc., for like, you know, uh, okay. mobile okay. and things like that. Hmm. Plasma 5 is the next generation of Plasma Workspaces. So Plasma Workspaces, like I said, is the desktop and all of the working environments. Plasma 5 is the most current version that's about to ship. Plasma okay. 2 and Plasma Next are Plasma 5. Those hmm. were their working names. You know, like how... Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, like Windows 95 had working names. Right, and, You know, yeah, XP yeah, yeah. had working long... You know, Vista was long or whatever. That's the working name. So Plasma Next, anytime you heard Plasma Next or Plasma 2 referenced... Now you can, in your brain, substitute that with Plasma 5. And again, Plasma 5 is the desktop environment. Okay. KDE applications are all the applications that are created using KDE libraries. Mm -hmm. KDE frameworks are the libraries and software frameworks that allow you to create graphical applications, formerly referred to as the KDE platform, now called Jeez. KDE frameworks. QT uh, okay. is the application framework and graphical toolkit that KDE frameworks is based upon. So there are non-KDE applications that could use KDE, like... Google Earth, VLC, Skype, for example. Okay. Those okay. are not KDE applications because they're using Qt. You become a right. KDE application when you use Qt and you call upon the KDE frameworks. Okay, okay. It doesn't I, necessarily mean you have to be on the Plasma boy. 5 desktop, though. I think the key thing is, as long as you don't have to know any of this to run the desktop, I think you're okay, because otherwise you're in real trouble. I mean, that's uh, a lot of information. Until now, there mm. was just a big bundle consisting of libraries, Plasma Desktop, and a lot of KDE applications that were released together regularly. This bundle was internally called the KDE Software Compilation. It seems like KDE is moving away from having the same release schedule for everything, which is why you're seeing everything broken right. out into its own name. They're individually going to be released as they're needed to okay. be released. So you're going to see things like new versions of KDE frameworks instead of a new version of KDE. No, I, I get, boy, you know, it's like, I it's it was necessary. So that's the rub. It's like, this was a necessary thing that needed to be elaborated on. The, the rub is that it is still very, very detailed. Um, I very have, detailed, but I it's have, important. I, I can see where they're I, coming I from. I think it's boy. all explained the fact that I have four pages printed yeah, out here to explain it, what tough. it is. I, I, feel I sh one, shouldn't take four pages to figure out how to right? explain what yeah. it is. I mean, it's like, I guess a part of it is also the fact that because Linux is so modular, you kind of have to go this direction. It's not like it's an all-encompassing OS. And, and because situation. the KD libraries yeah. themselves have become a standalone product, right? So now you have the framework. So here's the way to think about it. If you're a desktop user, you care about Plasma 5. If you're a developer, you care about KD frameworks and QT. I think the only nitpicking thing I would have is I think the calling your desktop plasma five unless it's powered by a warp core I, I don't <laughs> think that's it's horrible branding <laughs> so I mean to me if I'm trying to get like just average Joe to understand what the hell they're doing right I'm gonna call it KD desktop because that makes sense to I me. know that's the thing and you this know, is but where the rest of it I'm good frameworks that's good you okay, know cool. it's funny Matt you know. because um <laughs> everybody saying. talks about how arrogant the gnome team is oh yeah but <laughs> I see true genuine arrogance in the KDE camp when mm. they can it, not only do they find it to be a little offensive that we don't all just automatically understand how this works, but the suggestion that this might be overly complicated to them seems like juvenile. Like, come on, really? You can't get this? Um, and I, I, I find that to be true indications of arrogance because it is unnecessary complications. It's, it is way too bloated and it has a freakish 
striking similarity to how Microsoft names things. And so often we refer to KDE as the Windows desktop for Linux. And yet here we are now when it comes down to the naming. And now they're also the desktop naming convention that looks like it came from Microsoft. It does. This feels like it should be a Microsoft product. It really does. You know, I, I just, at the end of the day, I, I do definitely, and desktop environment, you know, situations, a lot of times the communities behind them, you do get a sense of arrogance. Uh, you know, I mean, if I, they don't, if they don't like, for instance, they don't think we get it. I got a news flash. I don't care. Um, no offense. I just don't. I, so, I mean, you know, I don't but, mean to be, su to, you know, to, to, so for them to care about what I feel, but I'm not trying to single any individual out. Yeah. I mean, as a group, I feel arrogance. I don't feel arrogance from any particular right. individuals. I right. just feel like as a group, yeah. there is this, uh, there's I, sort I, of this attitude. Like, what do you mean you don't get the, this? the group think that makes up uh, the community? Sure. Yeah. I, and I said, any, any desktop environment, I've definitely experienced that. Katie is among them for sure. Um, I you hope, know, I yeah. hope it like, I hope now we just stay with this. I hope there's no more name changes because it's, it, you really, you don't even get to do it twice, well, the really. Th the and thing, now you're doing yeah. it three times. The thing I've noticed with Katie is that it's, if there was ever a desktop environment that was built with the developer brain set, I mean, like, it, it was that. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's like, you know, you know what we need on our settings? We need settings. And then we need settings for our settings. It's that, that advanced well, control, that advanced I, drill down thing that they're really targeting. And that's who they're going for, I think. Because I'll tell you what, I've parked it in front of numerous newbies. you got to be kidding me. No. Hmm. Nay are not having that. I, I mean, I think maybe part of it, too, is like yeah. the frameworks themselves have yeah. become so successful that they're almost their own product. So I, yeah. Think, yeah. I think they're a bit, they're, they're a bit compelled to do this. Um, however, I want to talk about something the GNOME project's doing, and I want to contrast it to what the KDE project's focusing on. Because yeah. what the KDE project seems to be doing is taking a very long-term look at infrastructure and what makes a great desktop. I mean, that's how right. we got Plasma and all this in sure, the first place. Sure. And QML integration, mm -hmm. all of that. Because the KDE camp is really good at looking at the long-term trajectory and saying, boy, if we built a platform, they will come. And it doesn't yet yeah, actually think... seem to be the case. <laughs> no. And I mean, they, they kind of found that out the hard way on another platform. So I don't know. I mean. Well, you know what? And maybe we're wrong because for Jim in the chat room, it's not too complicated for him. Well, yeah. Well, and, and here's the thing of it is, is that, and I, you know, worked with newbies for so many years that I, it, it always amazes me how people lose touch with this. Not everybody's a geek. I know that. I know it's like a big secret, but. There's a there's an entire segment of the population They'll never that get doesn't this. understand. They'll never that. get it. Yeah, and so you know, so at the end of the day, your opinion for you is awesome, right? But that's not gonna that's not gonna reflect on your mom or your your friends or whatever it is. It just isn't. I think for um, what it tells me so. is all of that stuff. Yeah. has to be for KDE to be successful as a desktop component. And it just it, it's not even like it has to be. This is just right. how it will work, is all of that will be abstracted away from the user. They right. won't know anything about frameworks. They won't know anything about Plasma. What they will know right. is they are running a Linux of something kind of some kind of Linux thing right. that's using yeah. this great desktop environment that it has great performance, has a, a beautiful new theme. I'm thinking like a year down the road, right? <laughs> right, right? This is what they'll know. And all of the other stuff is just implementation details that the geeks like us will yeah. talk about. Well, and I think the best desktop environment experiences I've had with new users is usually something I've customized for that user. Like one individual in the chat room points out that he has a father that likes KD. And that's great. You know, he was able to identify with that desktop. I think everybody out there has that one desktop, whether it be customized or otherwise, that yeah. they can kind of identify with um you know uh unity haven't had a ton of luck there but i've definitely had good luck with setting up docs or setting up like a uh, xfc type situation matey whatever it may be you know keeping wanna, it simple i want to talk about now here's what yeah. gnome is focusing on and i don't want everybody to freak out uh what, what we're yeah. about to talk about i think has the potential for the linux community to respond very badly and I think everybody needs to take a deep breath. Okay. Uh, okay. The GNOME project is uh, talking very seriously about application sandboxing so that individual applications oh, wow. are contained within their own sandbox. And Guadec is coming up, the GNOME uh, user and developer conference. That's mm -hmm. coming up in a couple of weeks. So a lot of the prominent GNOME developers and folks at Red Hat and uh, uh, Fedora okay. are uh, right. in, in the last three days, I, I have them all listed in chronological order, right. have blogged about desktop containers mm. being the way forward for the GNOME desktop and, and, and uh, isolating applications mm. from the system and from each other and then using a set of clearly defined APIs uh, mm. that then they can communicate with. There's a lot to be said about sandbox applications. I think there's, uh, <laughs> this is, it's interesting. There's a couple of things that are happening. So the GNOME project's been talking about this for a couple of years. Lenart Pottering, creator of Pulse Audio and System D and many other things, has had this also an idea for a long time that even predates predates Docker called Linux apps. And Lenart's gone around talking about Linux apps, mm -hmm. and his idea has been a way 
to distribute applications on the Linux desktop, kind of similar to how they're distributed on Mac OS X, where everything oh, okay. looks like it's in a single file. So if right. you want the latest version of Quasal IRC, mm -hmm. I could give you this single f application file, and you could I could put it on a thumbstick from my computer. You could put it in your computer and copy it onto your computer and just run it. Is it similar to the, you remember click with a K? Um, is it similar to that to where it's like the self-contained? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, everything could be in there. there it could be statically right. linked or not. Uh, it uses it. a set of APIs. The idea is it's portable between machines because instead of calling on specific things, it's using a set of APIs available to it. Mm. And the, this would not replace like your package manager. So system level yeah. packages would be managed by your local package manager. User level applications like a lot of GNOME apps and things like that, that be would horrible. be packaged up in sandbox. I think the only thing that I would want to see happen, and the reason why I think Click never took off, was the fact that it updating applications because they were, yeah. you know, it was kind of a self contained thing. It's kind of like you, that's you gotta, it. Yeah, you do kind of have to work that out. So you would have to have a system in place that still encompasses that, but also provides an update, a separate updating tool that allows that to still happen. They can do those two things together. Now we're talking. So an application that Sandbox would have only access to a limited set of system APIs mm -hmm. uh, would have managed access to system APIs, too, so that applications might have to ask for permission to say to your right. webcam. They've already been experimenting this with Cheese. So now when you mm -hmm. launch Cheese, it, it, it's sandboxed, and it asks you for permission to access your webcam like, it might, like you might on a smartphone. Very cool. Uh, effectively tracked and managed by the host operating system. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be installed and updated independently of the host operating system. Uh, so, like, if there's dependencies in the host operating system, it's not affected by those, and can include any dependencies that are not provided mm -hmm. by the operating system. Now, they talk about a lot. There's a lot of um, value in having sandboxed applications. Uh, number one, for developers, it tells them this is the box you play in. Right. This is what you need to target. These are the officially supported APIs. Because one of the problems in Linux is there's a lot of choice. Oh yeah. And you could narrow down some of that choice. Now you are eliminating some of the choice too, so well, that comes with negatives. Well, and also I think like um, you know, 32 bit, 64 bit, uh, different distros have, have different uh, file setups in some occasions. Uh, not usually extreme, but they are there. Uh, little things like that. I think by having that self-contained yeah. package, that does allow to say, okay, whether you're going from X to Y to Z to whatever, it's always going to be the same deal. That's well, kind of cool. And there was some speculation that too that like one of the value propositions of the Linux desktop right. is the security that it offers. Mm. But in in actuality, once you're running on the X11 desktop, there is a lot of nefarious things an application can do. Right. Applications are not protected from each other. Where sandboxing would enable that, they would also be using Wayland in this setup. Okay. So this depends on potentially maybe Docker, uh, mm. some kernel level stuff, and Wayland for all this to work together because they're actually able to isolate it at the display server level too, which is incredible. Nice. I, I don't fully understand how that works, but Wayland itself can be sandboxed. That would be neat. Yeah, that, you know, it has a lot of potential. They just got to get the updating thing figured out. And this yeah. is, I think, application. Uh, the, for right now, you know, it's really hard for develop. A lot of developers expect to be able to write a binary and then distribute that to Linux users and have it work across right. all of their machines. No. Uh, not really so, but a development platform built on sandboxing and containerization will provide a stable base which Apple application authors could target. This will allow application authors to target specific versions of the platform to easily distribute and update their applications and have greater confidence in how their applications will look and perform in the hands of users. It will make it easier for developers to independently distribute their applications should they want to. Interesting. And I think as we look at a world that's migrating away from Windows, where this has maybe been a little bit more of the accepted practice, mm -hmm. those expectations might also move with the users. And so this type of functionality could right. be important. Early days, they're going to talk about it more in a couple of weeks at Guadec, and we'll be watching that to see what comes out of it. But well, I like right, the, the fact, sandbox yeah. scare you? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think the cool thing is that they're trying, not only are they trying something cool and new, which is always awesome, but I think they're trying to actually solve a problem versus just building stuff because they think it should be so. Um, I, I feel like that that's definitely the direction they're taking. They're like, they're saying, look, this is an issue. Let's let's not kid ourselves. People complain about it all the time. How are we going to address that? Right. I think they're actually trying to tackle it head on in a logical way. Does that mean they're going to do it well or I'm not going to com complain yeah, we'll about see, it? Right? Come out? I'll probably complain yeah, all day long. Yeah. But who knows? I like the fact they're trying. I like too, uh, because mm -hmm. what what we just talked about last week right. was a universal application package format that might be ushered in by systemd and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what this would lead to eventually. <laughs> Not at the core system. Your yeah. core system would still be managed by your package manager, it looks like. But the user level applications would essentially become a universal container format that moves around between distributions. And here's the fun part, and it will happen. Um, and and I and I can I can understand this. I'm not dismissing this at all. Many 
regular Linux users are going to scream. They are going to have <laughs> yeah. a fit. That's what I think. I want people and, to think about know, this before they freak out. And I would remind them that the system stuff is not being done this way. This is just the user level and, stuff. And to it's be realistic, ideal, it's okay. To be realistic, uh, and especially initially, it's only going to be no maps. Yeah, I mean, it's not, you know. And now, if they were doing this with system stuff, I'd scream with you, but it's not. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then if it's successful and it, then it's adopted. And what's cool about it is it's not like necessarily like a known proprietary yeah. container. Yeah. They're either going to use Docker or they're going to use a lot of the same kernel level technologies like KD bus and other stuff that Docker already uses. So it is stuff to, to accomplish the containerization and the sandboxing. They're using built in Linux technologies in a desktop. Computer. Definitely. So it's and they're doing it in a rational way. They're not yeah. trying to take on everything. They're doing it the things that really do need it. And it would help development. It really would. And they've really been talking about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the technologies are finally getting there with Wayland and Docker yeah. and the kernel recent kernel updates and and, and the need. It's it's all kind of coming together. So I think that'll be a big topic. I wonder if it'll. I mean, I assume it would uh, address the fact that oh, I want to run uh, Kmail for example in GNOME. Okay, so first I'm going to install you know half a. Tr a trillabyte of freaking I, I think it would. KDE libraries, you know, or yeah. whatever. I, if they can address that kind of thing, that would be awesome. You'd, you'd still have to still have those mm. libraries, but you might not have to have them all over your entire That's what I mean. System. I don't mind having the libraries. I just don't want them yeah. bleh, everywhere. Shot, shot all, your all over the place, and, and then yeah. i got to clean it up when I want to. Yeah, I don't want to deal with that. So. Hey, let's talk about a mess. I want a mess. Uh, <laughs> their story, like, I didn't know what to make of oh, this. I, Manjaro Linux devel yeah. uh, developers experienced a mass exodus, according to an article at Phronix. Now there's been several updates, as well as, like, Phony posters claiming to be Manjaro developers. Oh, uh, we saw some of them even in our own subreddit. Mm -hmm. Matt, what the what the heck's going on with Manjaro? Well, you know, so I, as many of you know, I have a I have two main boxes. I have my daily box that happens to just run Arch or Integros technically, but and then I had a second box that ran, that I, I consider to be more my gaming box that I ran Manjaro on. Well, I ran updates like I always did, never had a problem. Uh, one of the updates apparently affected a, a video driver. And, you know, I'm talking to who I assume is a developer. I'm beginning to wonder now, <laughs> um, you know, back and forth. And, uh, you know, when I say talking to, I'm actually reading in a read-only format on a forum post that this video driver error is known. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's pretty much it. Oh, and hey, by the way, go to the uh, go to the AUR. There's some package thing that's kind of a workaround, kind of half, not really, won't build. So don't worry about that. Um, you know, and so, so there's two things i'm left not knowing was that genuinely a developer that i was reading the forum post that's a for? little weird to think about yeah and then you know on top of that w with this exodus of people if that is in fact actually happening i assume it is um where does that leave the project so for me uh, i kind of had to back out and say wow i i don't have time for this um i went with the debian distribution on that box for now that's just kind of what i did solid so, xk solid xk or solid x rather but yeah Good call. I Good mean, call. XFC on it. so I think the Manjaro project, you know, they, they, they got the core developers still. They're still ticking. I don't. Yeah. I think maybe it's reduced in staff. Um, at the end of the day, and I have links to all the forum posts if you guys want to read through the drama. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, they obviously have issues to deal with. Um, but I, this is the kind of thing that is is a black stain on the reputation of a distribution it for really years. Yeah. And uh, I feel really bad for the Manjaro folks because it's unfortunate this had to go mm -hmm. public. You know, it's these kind of things you'd hope would stay behind closed doors because honestly, you look right. at this, you go, these guys are not serious. This is not ready for prime time. This is right. this is a clown show. And well, yeah. I'm, I'm sure despite all of their, and which is unfortunate because they've been working for years well, now to build a good community. It started out awesome, but then it just slowly, little things weren't being addressed. Um, you know, I liked the way they were doing things initially, but then it just slowly started going downhill and the fact that something is obvious this is one like a system dependent thing this was a, a graphic driver issue that would affect pretty much most people running nvidia graphics um if you're trying to play steam kind of a big thing yeah Fine. i mean yeah. I, I hope the best for the manjaro projects because Jeez, it's a guys. distribution that's got a lot of excitement around it a good growing community and uh yeah, i like bad. their style too i mean yeah. they've got a great style yeah and at, at the end of the day though matt uh i if i know i said that a lot but i really come down to this like yeah. it really for me comes down to i can't I, no, for me, I, there's there are other distributions that uh, one of the reasons I guess what I'm trying to say is one of the reasons I run Arch aside from the other technical stuff is right. I am really really burnt out on distribution politics. Like it yeah. really is like after after a decade more of it, I am just yep. so burned out on it that it, it anything like that immediately is a turnoff. Well, and that was just it for me. Could I have probably overcome it? Sure. But as you pointed out, the politics were behind it. I just, I, you know, because that was a box that I don't want. It's not like my arch box where I can just update it whenever. I want to leave it the hell alone. I don't want to have to do anything with it. I just want it to work. And that particular box has that role. So by going with something else, 
uh, that doesn't seem to have those politics behind it for yeah. now. Um, and again, if something happens, I will just go straight to Debian. But I was in a hurry, so I just went. I just went solid X. It was fine. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, best of luck to the Manjaro project. Yeah. I hope you know. I think they, you know, they, it's not like the whole team left. They still no. have folks there. They just had some forum members leave, and they it, had. Yeah, it's a good know, project, but they need to really monitor how the, some of these forum posts. The, are the being public monitored. image really needs a, a, a refreshing yeah. now. I think. And, it, uh, but it's a great distro. I'm not. I'm not. You know. Oh, it served me well. Uses. It served me very well, yeah. and I still and um, we're still running on my nephew's laptop. Oh yeah, so, yeah. He, he well, there you go. He don't care about he the politics. Care. He's still playing his emulators. He ain't gonna rip. Yeah. All right. Well, we got links to all that. <laughs> if you guys are Manjaro Manjaro users are just mm-hmm. interested and want to read through the threads and the That's posts right. and and the core developer has been posting in the forum and talking about it too. Yeah. You can check through all of that stuff as well as the sure, Phronix article was updated twice and the updates are in there. Yeah. Uh, it, it's hard to really say for sure what's going on. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it because, uh, you know, like both Matt and I mm-hmm. are fans of the distro. Yeah. Uh, so we hope the best for him. I hope it works out. All right, Matt. That's all the news for this week. We're about to talk to Maddie, the core developer of Kali Linux. But before we get to that, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76, creators Woo-hoo. of machines born to run Linux. This is a System76 crew here at the Jupiter Broadcasting Headquarters. Everywhere we have a Linux box, we want a System76 box. And slowly but surely, we're replacing a lot of our older systems with System76 rigs. And let me tell you why. These systems are specifically engineered to run Linux. The great th- It starts really at like the keyboard. The keyboard c- controls work under every distribution. It then it goes to the BIOS where System76 has customized it to work perfectly with Linux. And if there's any modifications they need to make to the boards, they make those too. And one of the systems that I think don't get enough attention is their custom-built desktop PCs. Mm-hmm. We've tried out the Retel Performance, the Wild Dog Performance, and the Leopard Extreme, and they've all been awesome machines. And depending on what your workload is, there's one of those that will do it for you. I think the Retel Performance is the uh, silent hit that not enough people talk about. It's small, it's extremely powerful, and it's very quiet, which is a really big deal for me. The Leopard Extreme we, even even doing our media production workflow here, we couldn't make this thing cry. And it just runs Linux beautiful. It's it's water cooled. It has tons of drive options for hot swapping drives. Uh, a really really impressive rig. And, and they build these right here in the U.S. of A. So go over to system76.com. Get a computer that's born to run Linux. Stop fighting with your hardware and play with your Linux. And tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. System76.com. They have a free wireless upgrade to a really, really nice wireless chipset in the uh, Ultra Pro right now, too. Sweet. So it's definitely worth going to check that out. All right, Matt. Well, joining us on the show right. right now is the core developer of Kali Linux, Maddie, a.k.a. Mutz. Maddie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for having me. So uh, I'm pretty excited to talk to you because I used to do a little bit of penetration testing back in the day, and uh, I had a little bit of time with Black with Backtrack. Uh, but I want to introduce you to the audience in case they didn't, they're not really familiar with who you are, and then you can correct me if we've gotten the bio wrong. Uh, so, Maddie is the founder and core developer of Kali Linux, uh, and he's also the CEO of Offensive Security. Over the past year, Maddie's been developing a curriculum designed for users who wish to make the most out of Kali Linux, and he's going to have a talk at Black Hat soon. Oh, sweet! Did I get all of that right, Maddie? More or less right. Um, at, at Black Hat, we, we've got a couple of things going. We've got a few uh, a few courses um, that we're giving, and then. Uh, I think it's the last day of Black Hat. We've got a full day workshop, which uh, which is basically free for for all attendants. Oh, a full day workshop, which is going to wow. be that's that's going to be crazy, that's intense. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of stuff covered there. Uh, so why don't we start a little bit at the beginning for folks who are maybe not as familiar uh, with Kali Linux? Uh, why did you want to set out to create a distribution that is designed to maybe break into computers or could be used for nefarious purposes? Obviously, it has legitimate purposes, too, but what was sort of the motivation to get started there? Well, um, it started from my own personal needs um, for a penetration testing environment, which was stable and, um, and something that, that was repeatable, something that I could uh, get back to um, in my work. Um, and and that's that's essentially how how the the concept started. Um, sharing this with a few people and it started getting popular, um, which then prompted you know better development. Sure, yeah, I got people more serious about it. Uh, so, do you still work in the security penetration testing field right now? Do you have a day job where you go to clients and you test out their network? Absolutely, absolutely. Our company does a couple of things. Um, we, we deal both with security services, which includes stuff like penetration testing, and um, we also give training services. Oh, okay. So that's what that's the offensive security portion of your business, right? Okay. Right, right. That, that, that's essentially the the commercial line behind the, the the open source product. So, how long have you been doing offensive security? 
Offensive security, I think, is around eight years old now. So Could, is, we've been around. <laughs> we've been around for a while. I wonder, um, and uh, I just want to kind of get your perspective of somebody who's been in that field for so long. Do you do you see a dramatic change in the industry over the last few years? Has the tone changed? Uh, and uh, has that been good for your business? Has that been good for Cali Linux? Or has that put an uncomfortable spotlight on Cali Linux? Um, I think I think there's been so many changes that it, it's hard to put your finger, you know, on, on one thing specifically. I think um, I think that there's been a mass movement of awareness to security, right. um, which in general has been good for us and good for Caddy. Um, but I think that there have been been several, you know, opposing opposing things which have been happening as well. So it's it's hard to define everything in in a single sentence. Are you concerned though that Cali Linux could become in a position of gaining unwanted attention? I think of the recent uh, revelation about folks who searched for Tails, for example, and the reason Tails was flagged was because it was for those who were privacy and security conscious. Well, that's exactly what Cali Linux is too. Re well. You know, it's, it's interesting because at the end of the day, um, Kali doesn't deal with privacy at all. It deals with penetration testing. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is, though, that it, it can be used for nefarious purposes. And, and as it can be used by a penetration tester, it can also be used by a malicious hacker. Um, I often get asked, you know, if, if with Kali Linux, do I feel like I'm enabling the bad guys in any way by giving them tools that make it easy to, you know, to attack targets? And the fact is that I, I don't think that, I, that, that we are in that sense. I think the bad guys are enabled. They don't need our help to do it. And I think, if anything, we're leveling the playground for, for the good guys. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a double-edged sword. But, you know, with, with these things, you, you need to know where the line is. And I think, I think our team is quite adept at that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, my my career definitely took a step up when I realized the best approach to security was to design and implement and engineer the best network I could, but then to verify it all the time, constantly. And, absolutely. and that's where tools like in my day, Backtrack and now Kali Linux uh, were unbelievably valuable, unbelievably value, uh, valuable. And these these tools started to emerge when the security auditing industry was really starting to double down on extremely premium services, really expensive like um, uh, right. feeds for vulnerabilities and things like that. And these, right. these distributions came around at a time that really leveled the playing field. And so for old timers like me, could you explain the backtrack to Cali transition just so I have that clear and maybe some of our audience does too? Well, um you know this this whole this whole backtrack and, and before that Wapix and Wax um, distribution started started from you know a sort of hobby, um, and over the years it's it's grown and developed. But at some stage, uh, I mean, we were developing backtrack for seven years, and at some stage we realized that we we've hit our our limit with what this operating system can offer. I mean, it's a great platform for tools, um, you know, for various pen testing tools, but that's, that's all Backtrack was. And we realized that with a, with a proper Linux um, build environment and with a proper setup, we could make it much more than, than what it just is. Um, so we, we had a long, rough thought about how we could uh, go about this, and we realized that we, we'd probably need to build everything from scratch. Um, and that basically prompted the whole move from Backtrack to Kali. Um, and now, you know, looking back at a year's worth of development on, uh, of Cali, I have I have no doubt that it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing for us. And you've recently, or semi recently, made a transition to Debian, and a lot of our audience wanted to write in and get kind of your post Debian transition thoughts. Was that a good move, and how has that been going? Um, it, it's it's been a wonderful move for us because essentially, um, because we moved to Debian and because we've uh, adhered so strictly to Debian standards, it means that we can the, the shoulders of giants in many, many cases. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, things like, you know, Kali Amazon Im images, how difficult they would have been to, to have to build from scratch. And, For EC2. Right, right. Um, and, and how simple the job was made just by leverage, leveraging on existing Debian scripts. You know, they just needed a few edits, a few fixes here and there, a few improvements, and, and wham, suddenly you have a, a whole Kali environment in, in EC2. Yeah, that, um, that is really nice. And it's great for remote vulnerability testing. Right, right. And this is just, just a single example from dozens, you know. It's just, it's just the... the, the um, advantage of, of 
being able to to stand on on the shoulders of giants and and leverage all these little things which then make your distribution much much more um interesting i wonder have you uh you must be aware that there seems to be some ground swelling around people using cali as their full-time Linux desktop. They're using it as their main distro, not just for penetration testing, but uh, everyday stuff. W what do you think about that phenomenon, and why do you think that's happening? Um, I think that's happening because Kali Linux has just turned to be a very stable and reliable operating system, um, and very, very flexible, um, often more flexible than other distributions around there. So, I, I can definitely see that happening. I mean, we, we, we support the latest kernel in each release, so you usually find that Kali has better hardware support um, than more traditional operating systems, say. Um, so I, I can definitely see that happening. Um, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't it, surprise it me to It seems to me, though, that a core component of uh, Kali Linux being so... Um, so widely adopted, not only for penetration testing, but also for desktop, is... Uh, you are doing, an, your team and you are doing an exceptionally good job of keeping the distribution current and relevant. So one of the things that's happened in, in previous penetration testing distributions is they make a really big splash with a lot of really great tools, but these tools deprecate and new ones are created very rapidly. Uh, it's a, right. it's a, and but yet Kali has managed to uh, stay up on it. And I, I can't imagine that even with a team of, of uh, that you have, how, how does everybody manage to figure out what's the best stuff to keep putting into future Kali releases? Because that, I think, too, plays a key role in its popularity. Right. There's, I, I, think, I think you nailed it on the head right there. I, I mean, there's, there's two aspects to this. One aspect is which tools do you add, um, which is always an interesting question. And what we usually find is that we prefer adding the tools that we have a bit of experience with. Um, you know, suddenly we'll be on a pen test, we'll discover a new, a, a new environment that suddenly brings up a new tool and we'll, we'll use it and we'll say, hey, that would be a, a really great addition to, to Kali. Um, of course, we accept suggestions through our bug track. And when those come, we, we analyze each tool um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis and then try, try to figure out if this is something that we want to add to the distribution or not. Um, the other aspect, of course, is uh, maintenance, which is um, an ongoing commitment um, that you have, to, you have to continue doing vigilantly. Right, absolutely. Um, new tools, new versions of tools come out, and you know, if, if you stay outdated, then that tool is, is more or less useless. Suddenly, your users have to build a, a static build you know, in some other directory, and, and all that usefulness of package management sort of goes out the window. So one of the things that been, we've been working on and, and will continue working on is, is um, package tracking and um, automating builds of, of, up, uh, of um, upstream updates. Oh, that's cool. how, how big is the Kali Linux development team? <laughs> um, it's it's got a very small core. Um, I think we're around three or four people at the core, uh, and then we've got a bunch of contributors around us. Very good. You know, um, uh, you you spoke with uh, producer uh, Q Five Sys JT uh, over email, and uh, one of the things that both he and I are very excited about is the opportunities of Kali Linux on devices like the Raspberry Pi. Now he's used it for like this really this super minimal portable um, penetration testing setup. I love it from the standpoint of mo almost like a permanent network appliance that's maybe doing mm -hmm. automated penetration testing, super low power, low maintenance. Uh, what is Kali Linux's intention towards devices like the Raspberry Pi? Are these devices like this possible to support with the advanced tools that Kali has? And what's the future there for Kali Linux? Well... <laughs> The, the, the fact is that we've got several images for Raspberry Pi. Um, we've got actually a whole bunch uh, of ARM images for, for various, um, various uh, devices, common devices, Raspberry Pi obviously being one of them. Um, I mean, we've got an image for a Galaxy Note. We've got an image for a, a UT Lite. We, we've got a whole bunch. I think we've, we've probably got just, just less than a dozen. Wow. Um, and these are all maintained uh, and, and up-to-date and downloadable through our website. But specifically talking about the, Cali, um, the, the, the Raspberry Pi, yeah. um, we do actually have uh, some cool images, pre-made images, which um, integrate um, an LCD touchpad. Um, so it's, it's, it's like a small you know, wow. pen testing rig based on um, some free scripts that I found. Um, if I remember correctly, the name was... SlyPy, 
Um, so, so we sort of took a Kali image, um, built some stuff around that, and we have a really, really cool demo, which um, we'll be showing at the Kali Dojo at, at, at the cons. Um, and the script to build this image is actually available on our GitHub page. So if, if you if you check that out, um, I, I could send you a link later, you'll see that the script is, is editable, downloadable, and it, it does provide some pretty cool things out of the box. Very cool. I'm really excited, especially as those types of devices get even more powerful. Um, one of the things that I found that my clients consistently wanted is they would want a baseline uh, analysis, come in, own their Windows boxes like you always can, and then they would... They want something that's like a quarterly checkup, but they don't necessarily want to pay exorbitant prices for that. And uh, I, one of the things, the two things that uh, Backtrack and Kali Linux enabled was for me as an independent contractor to go in there and charge them a fair price for my yeah. expertise and, you know, not overdo it. Uh, and b because I could use tools exactly that were, yeah. you know, accessible to me. And that yeah. set my budget at a certain price point. Mm -hmm. That allowed me to get in there and give them the service they need to secure right. their network. So it's not just like, oh, yay, now I could go make a buck. But also it's like it makes security auditing accessible to 10 people-sized businesses up to, you know, 1,000 people enterprises. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm really uh, I'm really excited about Kali Linux and, and a hardware like that for ty those types of uses. But I want to talk to you about one thing that I caught in the subreddit. In a response to a question, you said, one of my personal crusades in the next few months is to try and increase awareness of the flexibility of Kali Linux and try to change people's mindsets about what our project has to offer. I have a feeling you were kind of just touching on that a little bit with these scripts. Yeah. Could you expand on that a little bit about some of the flexibility that Kali offers and how maybe people don't fully appreciate that? Right. I, 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 think, I think this ties in with, with the question that you asked in earlier as well, you know, the difference between Backtrack and Kali. Um, I mean, of, of course, Kali is a wonderful platform for all these pen testing tools, um, as are other distributions, you know. I mean, is Nmap really much different on Kali than, than on anything else? Right, and the right. answer is probably not. Um, so, of course, you know, we have a whole array of tools and we keep them updated and that's, that's all, all great and nice. But the the thing that i admire about about caddy is is this flexibility and when i'm talking about flexibility i'm talking uh, you know things which are, are specifically relevant for, for pen testing it's all these features that we've been investing time and effort in um i i don't know if you've had an opportunity to see but if you head on to the to, to the Kali um, Kali .org website and click on the documentation page, then we've got a short list of features there, and, and these things include like you know a, a, a Lux nuke feature um, or um, encrypted uh, USB persistence. So ah. all these all these cool cool features which really mean a lot um, to people in the pen testing field, um, and these features are often unique to us. Um, I'll, I'll expand on this a bit more. I mean, we had a really cool feature, um, the Lux New. I'm, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with, with what that did. Yeah. But basically what, what that allowed us to do is to um, have an emergency um, Lux password that uh, once given would actually nuke your hard drive and delete all the key slots. Um, so you could give somebody a fake oh, wow. password. That, that, that's one that's one scenario um, the scenario which is probably more relevant to a pen tester is um, sort of bricking your laptop before travel and then unbricking it when you get home love that um, oh nice yes yeah. these, these are these are serious issues that pen testers have to deal with yes. I mean imagine you've just you've just had a, a massive pen test and you, you've, you've completely murdered this this organization and yeah. suddenly your laptop has you know right. with, with that report on it has to has to go through someone's hands it's extremely so, confidential information right so i mean these are these are solutions to to practical problems that that exist in our field um and i think that cali cali is really pulling through um way beyond the tools because now if you look at another feature that we've put together which is um Live, uh, a live USB installation, right? So you can take the ISO, the Kali ISO, DD it on a, on a USB drive, right. and then you'll have a, a live USB drive, which isn't that exciting. Um, but then you can now add persistence to this. So any changes that you make will actually be um, saved on, on the USB drive. And then on top of that, you can now add encryption. Mm. So you can have an encrypted persistence. Um, but now if you take the Lux nuke feature um, and combine it with with what i've just been talking about then suddenly you have a whole new animal 
um, you know, so, so these features just keep on adding. And I think, I think this is the, the, the serious benefit that Kali can give over other pen testing distros. One of the many, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at your uh, site right now. Look at all these ARM images they have, Matt. Look that at is that. crazy. The Q box. I, that's what I should. Oh, that's what I should right? do with my Q box. There it is. There it is. <laughs> well, I like the pen drive approach because I mean, you could tr literally just UPS if you got to like fly. You could just you, instead of you know yeah. nuking the hard drive. Yeah. You can just go ahead and uh, UPS that, and then yep. uh, your your hard drive is just whatever, and uh, you know, absolutely you're good to go. Right. TSA don't care. Yes, they don't care. They don't see it. That's uh, okay. Maddie, uh, this is good stuff. Uh, one more time, if, if people happen to maybe be lucky enough to go to uh, Black Hat, what, where should they find you, and what's the talk called again? Um, it's a whole-day workshop. So the, the, it's called the Kali Linux Dojo, and I think, I think it's happening at Black Hat and um, BrewCon in Europe uh, a few months after that, and then also in um, DerbyCon. So we're, we're trying to, to get the word out there as much as possible. Um, and I, I believe it's on the last day of the briefings in Black Hat. We'll have a link to it in the show notes, too, if folks want to uh, read up about it and so they don't miss it. Uh, you can go to uh, this uh, episode uh, 321 show notes and uh, find a link. Matty, is there anything else you want to touch on before we run? Um, no, I think I'm good. I'm, I'm really, really happy that you guys gave me the opportunity awesome. to, to get my word out there. Oh, no, absolutely. Keep up the great work. Yeah. Good luck with the talk. And uh, we'll be checking out Kali Linux after every single release and give it a spin. So we're looking forward to every release. Keep it up. Thanks very much, guys. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Matt, before we get out of here, Yeesh. I wanted to play uh, Noah's video yeah. from the uh, radio station that runs Linux. By the way, uh, this entire video, it's a little long, but it's great. I wanted to play the whole thing for you. It, it could have been its own segment, to be honest It really with you. could have been, yeah. And uh, what's super cool about this is not only does the whole station run Linux, but Noah edited it, the whole thing under Lightworks. Yeah, under he Ubuntu. was very proud of that. Yeah, it was awesome. He Although he's nice wearing job. Google Glass the entire time. He was. All, he yeah. And for you guys, he acknowledged yeah, this. He, he apologized. Did, <laughs> he did apologize. He acknowledged this. It was, And it happens. I mean, I do that with yeah. glasses. Don't forget I got them off. So. Yeah, I guess so. All right, yeah. so uh, you guys saw the first 20 seconds or so. We'll play that, and yeah. then we'll get into the rest of it. Uh, Noah, uh, show us your radio Hi, station. it's Noah, or Colonel Linux in the chat room. Some of you may recognize me from some of the interviews I've done for Jupiter Broadcasting, and this is my Runs Linux. My dad has devoted his life to making healthy food that actually tastes good. The project started when a local nonprofit group contacted him, asking him to be part of a local FM radio station they wanted to launch. After coming on board with them, they began to plan out the technical details of putting the radio station on the air. My dad suggested to the group that Altispeed, my company, might be able to help. After we got involved, we sat down and got a general idea of what they wanted to accomplish. The goal was to put a radio station on the air, be able to take remote broadcasts, have multiple people control or edit the station's content. All of this had to be reliable and of course had to stay within the budget. We're here in the Logos Radio Studio, and I'm just going to go through some of the equipment that's used. Um, obviously, content starts with a talent. So we have microphones that are mounted up here for the host to use, as well as a table with two microphones that we use for interviews, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Those microphones then go to this audio mixer right behind me. From that audio mixer over to the PreSonus audio interface, and then from that audio interface into the production machine. Now, from the production machine, we can either record audio or we can send it out over the air. Many people in the group were already using Linux, and they were on Ubuntu, so naturally we went with Ubuntu for the majority of the equipment here. You're welcome, Popey. The production machine is running Ubuntu 1404 LTS. The auxiliary laptop is also running 1404 LTS. Now we use this for bringing audio into the studio. So for example, uh, sound clips or Skype or Mumble. We actually found that Mumble actually gave us a better audio quality than Skype did, at least for music. Um, for voice, Skype seems to be a little bit better for, uh, for some of the concerts that we've put out. Uh, Mumble seems to work a little bit better, and so we have both. Many of the technologies, techniques, ideas, um, they all come from Jupiter Broadcasting because that's primarily, that's my primary source of entertainment content, and so naturally um, I sought to replicate a lot of the stuff that I saw work very well. 
Okay, over here is our interview table, and so essentially it's just a simple round table with two microphones. Now the microphone um, is actually being used for another project right now, and the, the other chair is performing a very important function, which I'll get to in just a couple minutes. Okay, this is the part that probably most of you are interested in. We're here inside of the server room, and this is where the magic happens. The first server here is our IceCast server, and what IceCast does, if you're not familiar with it, is is it allows you to send an audio stream to it, and then it rebroadcasts that back down to the receiving clients. So the station is using a piece of software called Dark Ice, and Dark Ice sends a stream up to the IceCast server, and then that goes back down to the receiving clients. The the um, IceCast server is running CentOS 6.5 x64, and the reason for that is I am a Red Hat system administrator, and so I'm most comfortable in CentOS. So like it or love it, that's what I decided to go with. Below it is the Airtime server, also running on CentOS 6.5 64-bit, and what Airtime does is it gives you a web interface and allows the radio group to schedule the content they want to play when they're not live and on the air. I said that the IceCast server sent down to receiving clients. Now I'm going to show you what those receiving clients look like. One of them, obviously, is what goes over the FM broadcast. So let's go take a look at what that looks like. Okay, you remember a couple of minutes ago when I said that that chair was performing an important function? It's holding up the transmission rack. Now this rack's eventually going to get mounted in the wall, but right now we're having some RFI issues, and so we're not sure if the transmitter is going to stay in this room. We need to wait until the Heliax cable actually gets installed, because if you know anything about radio broadcasting, you'll know that Heliax has a lot better shielding and suffers from leakage less than the LMR400 that's currently running the station. The box on top that actually receives the IceCast stream, it's using plain old VLC and it's running a GUI, which wouldn't be my preference. This is a temporary solution until a 1U computer can actually get installed. This is a Dell 15Z running Ubuntu 1204 64-bit. Now that stream comes out just through the audio jack and goes into the rack mixer. Again, in a perfect world, we would never be using the audio card built into a computer. Um, it's just a temporary solution until the permanent one gets here. That rack level mixer then sends to the DAS system. The DAS system is what interrupts the radio broadcast to give you severe weather alerts. Now incidentally enough, when I say that the entire radio station runs Linux, I don't just mean the parts that I had a hand in. This DAS encoder actually has an embedded version of Linux and it's, it's very Linuxy. I can actually SSH in and change config files to make changes to it. The last piece, of course, is the actual transmitter. Now, this is the part that takes the audio stream and modulates it into an FM transmission for people to listen on their car radios and however else you listen to FM radio. It's made by BW Broadcasting. It's a TX300 version 2. This also is running embedded Linux, although I found there was a Telnet port, but I wasn't able to actually authenticate into the box. I can only get to it through the web UI. Um, but all of this is feeding off of the IceCast server, or it's pulling down the stream from the IceCast server. We're here back in my office, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how we do remote broadcasting. Now, I had mentioned earlier that we use a piece of software called DarkIce, and what DarkIce is doing for us is it allows us to take an audio source that's coming into the computer and send it out over the IceCast stream. You can use the built-in audio interface of your laptop, or you can purchase an external USB audio capture device. I prefer the latter. I prefer the latter dramatically because not only does it drastically reduce the amount of interference incurred during the audio capture process, but it also drastically improves the quality. Taking around a traditional audio interface like the USB one we use in the studio isn't always practical. They're big and they're bulky, and I prefer to keep all the equipment that I use to a single bag. For that, I turn to the Icicle. Now, the Icicle is made by Chris's favorite audio company in the entire world. Hey the people that brought you the Blue Snowball. <laughs> On one side, you have an XLR uh -huh. phantom power jack that's that the one thing they make the I do like. microphone. Yeah. On the other side, we have a mini USB connector that I can use for connecting it to my laptop. And then in the middle, we have an attenuator in case the microphone is a little too soft or a little too loud. I love this device. I take it with me everywhere I go. If I travel, it's in my suitcase. And if I'm in town, it's in my computer bag. For my actual microphone, I prefer a broadcasting headset. Now, a broadcasting headset differs from a communication headset or a gaming headset in a couple different ways. First is the quality of the microphone. Now, the dynamic mic attached to this Audio-Technica broadcasting headset is of supreme quality. It captures my voice very accurately and at the same time discards background noise. The other thing that makes a broadcasting headset differ is the connectors used. 
it uses a XLR connector for the microphone and a quarter inch stereo jack for the headphones. Now this is fantastic because most pro audio equipment uses one of those two connectors. Connecting it to the computer is simple. I just simply plug the XLR into the blue icicle and then with a USB cable attach that to my laptop. For the headphone jack, I actually use a $4 adapter uh, I got off of Amazon that plugs right into the headphone jack of my laptop. Now I know what you're thinking. A couple minutes ago I just told you that the audio interface built into the computer is of poor quality and you shouldn't use it. And that's true, it is poor quality. However, for the purposes of the headphones, I don't really care about quality. All I care about is that I'm not over modulating the microphone and that I'm speaking directly into it. Now all of the software I've showed you and all of the hardware I've showed you is natively compatible with Linux. One of the things that really irks me is when I see a project that claims to be based in Linux and then when you look into it a little deeper you find out that they're using Wine here or NDIS wrapper there or a hack together script this. It's not that I don't appreciate these projects, I'm glad we have things like Wine so I as a Linux user who wants to live 100% in Linux can do so even if the software developers aren't willing to write software for my preferred operating system. But I think it's okay to toot the horn a little bit more for projects like ours that specifically are geared to use Linux. Everything I've showed you is either available in the repos or will run natively on Linux. All the hardware I showed you requires no tinkering. It will natively work out of the box with your Linux distribution, assuming it's modern. I have 1404 running on my work desktop. I have Arch running on my work laptop. I have Ubuntu 14.04 running in the studio. I use Fedora personally on my personal laptop and my home computer. All of this stuff works natively, um, both hardware and software, right out of the box. The only exception to my uh, all open source and no proprietary thing is Alan hosts the streaming service for us that goes onto the website, and he can't take an OGG stream, so we are sending him an MP3 stream. It's still coming from Icecast, um, but it is technically proprietary. That's my Runs Linux for this week, and I hope you enjoyed it. Man, that was awesome. That Good was work, Noah. Nicely done. And uh, well the, uh, the main software they're using there, Airtime, to uh, manage the schedule yeah. and the playlist and Icecast server. Same stuff we use for the jblive.fm and AM streams. Oh, yeah? Yep. Airtime, they, those guys are great. We have a hosted instance from them. That's and, awesome. Uh, hey, before we run, we're, we're going to wrap up. I just wanted to give a plug to the OSCon. Uh, we're going down to OSCon for a couple of days. Noah will be there. I will be there. Cool. And uh, Ick will be there. And we'd love to meet with you guys and maybe have a beer or a burger or something like that. <laughs> So OSCon will be there, I think, the 22nd and the 23rd of July in Portland, Oregon. There's a link to the thread in the subreddit. If you're going to be able to join us, we'd love to see you there. Definitely. Pro tip for anyone that's never gone, um, don't plan on uh, driving downtown. Um, ideally, uh, take a car in, like a group a group share or something like that. Hey, you'll, you'll thank me later. Yeah, in fact, I was. I got to talk to the guys about this because I was almost tempted with we'll find parking. taking <laughs> the train. Yeah. Um, and then walking to the convention center, but... Yeah, I mean, I love the idea of just like take, taking a couple hour train ride, yeah, having have Wi Fi the whole way down, and I mean, I'd say that's probably a good idea. But yeah. I think it's somebody there would have to pick me up. Uh, yeah, it, exactly. Yeah, I, you can, you know, uh, even a cab or you know. So whatever. if if somebody's going to be there and wants to give me a sure. ride from the train station, <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> hey Matt, if I wanted to read a little bit about what you've been up to throughout the week, where should I go? Uh, you can go to datamission.com, or you can actually uh, hit the show notes uh, when they're posted, and you can actually find all my linkage of the most recent stuff there. I have articles in the works that are coming up, but they aren't up yet so you Holy. can uh, catch up on my back catalog there you go a uh, little article recently about uh, xfce and of course when you're not writing you're making some videos that's right we are playing a little more battle block and theater you get a grenade. you all get grenades <laughs> i love it <laughs> everybody gets a grenade he's doing a little oprah replay there so so that's youtube.com slash geek in the game where that's you guys right. can check them out that's uh matt uh, cutting it loose uh, playing some video games. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give a plug for uh, my new uh, project that I'm working on throughout the summer. That's Tech Talk Today. Pretty proud of episode 24 because I think I did a pretty good takedown of Microsoft's new memo with the nice. new direction they put out. Uh, it turns out Microsoft's going to be mobile first and cloud first. Oh, and well, that's Microsoft. Cloud yeah. Mobile first. What? Yeah. Hold on yeah. a second. That it's sounds a three, like a couple it, of. They, they take a three pronged yeah. synergy uh, thing going Throw on. a little Xbox in there for spice. So uh, <laughs> it was interesting because as I was driving over to the studio to record episode 24 of Tech Talk today, the, the Microsoft story broke while wow. I was driving over. Wow. Well, I'm so, astounded they have a direction. I mean, congratulations, guys. It's only been freaking 20 years, but, yeah, you know. Whatever. I don't think so, Matt. Ouch. So uh, the Mumble and I, the Mumble Room and I, we took the yeah. memo. We all we all dug through it, and we gave you our thoughts on it mm -hmm. and uh, gave you some insights. Tech Talk today is turning out great. And basically, we take every 
current tech topic of the day news-wise that's happening in the technology industry and would give you a Linux user open source advocate's perspective nice. of the technology stories. What a concept. What a concept. What a concept, what? Matt. And don't forget, we want to hear your feedback over to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Mm. That's the probably the best place to give feedback or any kind of input you want to make, like stories we should cover, our runs yeah. Linux, a desktop pick, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Definitely. Or... If you like the email, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link. We got mm. the details there. And a pro tip, live stream. JBLive.tv, Sundays, 10 a.m., jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted okay. in your local time zone. Hang out in our chat room. It's a great – It's a great. We, we do all kinds of stuff off air with them. We do. We're well, it's, crazy. It's, it's on air, but it's not recorded. It's not recorded. Does that make sense? We're, t- we're TiVo-less. Uh, in that facet, we TiVo sort of. a portion of it, but not all of it. It's like, yeah, you got to kind of, yeah. you know, the streams align and you don't cross. Hey, the hey Matt, and uh, actually, it's called uh, GNU slash TiVo. GNU, yeah. GNU. All right, Where's I think that wraps us up for this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Oh, jeez, oh, one last quick plug, and then I'll I'll stop being obnoxious. <laughs> Relating to the KDE conversation, I right. should have mentioned this in the news. Okay, uh, we had a great talk talk with Joss Pavriat. Yes, uh, who was involved with the KDE project about KDE uh, Framework Five, Plasma Five, oh, yeah. all that stuff we had a great chat with him in linux unplugged last mm-hmm. tuesday so go check that out if you want more kde stuff and really get insights from somebody who's working in the project and has been working there for it's a really long good time. interview actually yeah. plus a little bit about uh, his new gig over at old cloud nice. as well so it's just a great interview all around all right that wraps us up for this week's episode of the linux action show we'll see you right back here next week bye Bruce. So uh, I gotta ask one question though before we uh, before we get started. What's with the baboon? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite way to portray my uh, my visual self. I love it. It's like uh, it's kind of unexpected. So it's yeah. like boom. There it is. Uh, although uh, you're gonna be at uh, Black Hat here pretty soon, so people are gonna. I mean, they're gonna be looking at your face for a while. Correct. That- have to suffer through that right mm. yeah that's okay i think they'll manage because i think the uh, i think people will f- feel the information is worth it you many 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 years ago actually it was probably back in the 90s we had this concept idea which never happened for obvious reasons of uh, basically you go and get you know you go, it's like a bar but it also has like a chuck e cheese type playground situation with a ball crawl and like a bouncy castle and basically and obviously you have to have hoses available to uh you know hose out the uh, what's going to happen when you have a bunch of drunk people in the ball crawl yeah for sure right <laughs> but it was kind of a cool idea it's like you know go get housed and go uh, do stuff go get housed is that what you said? yeah go get housed is that what you call it go, go get housed go get housed <laughs> go get housed nobody man. calls it that man nobody calls it housed that. man nobody calls housed. it that it's housed, it's housed. all right it was, sure it was back in the day I'm telling you uh, back in the day, housed. I believe you back in the day, but I don't. I, well, I actually don't know if I believe you. I've never housed? heard it called okay, housed. Chat room. How many people have heard housed? I think you'd be surprised. Oh, you know, because it could be because it took me an inappropriately long time to learn the phrase. Uh, Hi, it's Noah or Colonel. Uh, it took me like an inappropriately long time to learn the phase. Uh, the phase. Um, uh, the phrase. Uh, uh, take a piss or like yeah. getting pissed. You know that stuff. Like you I, guys I, never heard of that? wow. I yeah. never. Oh, I did. But I mean, in Bellingham, it's like that's all anyone ever says. Like, oh, I got housed. You know? I, no, they don't. Housed. Man. I swear to God. <laughs> You're making I that swear up. To God, you are housed. making I that swear up. To God. Housed. I'm serious. Nobody like, says that. Oh my God. I got it. I'm not gonna like dig up old people that I used to know to like <laughs> confirm this. I swear to God. Never. Where are you people been under a cage? Hosed? Who the hell is I think that's an Alaska thing, man. Hosed? I think now it could be an Alaska thing. It was up there too. I think it's an Alaska thing. I think it is. Maybe never housed. Really. Really? Man, I hate wow. YouTube. Yeah, okay, Urban Dictionary House, please. Yeah, yeah, go go do that. Go do that. That'll that'll just take care of it right you there. You crazy. I'm telling you. You crazy. You know, it's not like you're going to go get mobile homed. I mean, you're going to go get housed. <laughs> you're going to get a mobile homed. Uh, neither that's one of these like, things That's work. like the lower tier version. All right, okay. That's when you got a buzz. All right, we'll look into this in the next break. All right, uh, right. There is some investigations to be had. Uh, some shenanigans. Uh, I'm telling you. Hmm. At least that's what we don't know. Yep. House is where you were in the house six months of the year. What? Okay, that's some UK thing or something, probably. Uh huh. Okay. Whatever. All right. Okay. Anyway. All right. Okay. Whatever, people. All it's right. a conspiracy. Okay. You can all bite me. Yeah. <laughs> I well, you know what? We should make it a thing. I'm gonna get house mm-hmm. tonight. You know what? I haven't had any booze in that. I heard of heard heard it on TV. Yeah. See, see. And I'm not talking about the show. This <laughs> this house, this studio has been dry for weeks. Oh uh, yeah. It is unexcusable. Uh oh. It is. It is. There is no justification. He's not been mobile homed lately. He's, he's uh, yeah, I need to get housed <laughs> badly. Last time I got really housed, I went on air on Chase's show and I oh, did you? yelled at people about oh, their microphones yeah, and okay. all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So.